That's right. Big River guy. First time. That's First the time. On. The Muscatine City Council will come to order. Fran, would you do a roll call, please? Yeah, tonight. Council Member Graywall. Here. Fitzgerald. Present. Natvik. Present. Shahadi. Bynum. Phillips. Spread. Present. Four present and one absent here. I'm sorry, three absent here, Honor. Three absent. Very good. Very good. Okay, uh, folks, we have some items here. Uh, item number two, which is a request to approve professional services agreement for the Community Development Block Grant Downtown Revitalization Project. So the question is, is there a, uh, a motion to approve the request as submitted? So moved, Your Honor. Is that Phil? Yes, sir. Second. Second. Second, uh, <laughs> Scott. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries 4-0. Item number three on tonight's agenda is a Blue Zones update. Jody Hansen, you are on. <coughs> Thank you so much. Good evening. My name is Jody Hansen. Um, to those of you that do not know me, I am the Blue Zones Project Muscatine, uh, Blue Zones Project Muscatine Community Lead. Um, tonight, I would like to just share a couple updates on, on where we are now and just talk about some future events as well. Um, to date, we have 4,439 people who have signed the Blue Zones Pledge. So that means that they've pledged a healthy action. Um, and we'd like to increase that as well. So every year we see an increase in our engagement. So we'd like to continue that. Um, we have 25, or I'm sorry, 22 work sites that are designated and working on two additional work sites. We have 10 designated restaurants. We have three schools and, we're, and we are working with two additional schools right now. We have had um, really great success, obviously, with um, the community policies that you guys have really helped facilitate. Um, Cedar Street Project, as well as the Colorado Street Project. Um, it's truly amazing to see people using that trail and the path and walking, running, uh, pushing their kids in strollers, riding their bikes. Um, we're just so pleased to see that. Uh, the roundabout has also been a great addition um, as far as traffic getting, getting through, and we've heard really good feedback from that. Um, we'd also like to thank the council on your recent approval of the bike pedestrian master plan. Um, we appreciate your continued support of well-being aimed to help Muscatine live longer, better. Muscatine Community Gardens also continue to have support. Um, Muscatine Community Gardens has formed a community garden association. Um, so we meet monthly and we grew the community gardens from six to now nine and we're hoping to do even more in the future. Um, and that really gives folks like a great opportunity to socialize and to grow their own produce if they don't have yard space to do so. So we're really thrilled with that. And to celebrate that community gardens, we had a community garden party. Um, I think some of you may have attended. Um, it was a great time we had it at one of the community gardens just to show like what this is all about. And here's some great stories from the gardeners that go out there. And we, it was just a real nice time that we hope to replicate next year. Um, Blue Zones Project was heavily involved in the Healthy Living Festival this past weekend. And uh, as a committee member, I would like to thank Greg Monsager, uh, Mayor Hopkins, Andrew Fangman, and Rich Climes and the Parks and Rec staff for all of their hard work for that festival. Um, I know that was a great turnout and there were so many things going on in Muscatine that day, but we really appreciate people investing and in finding out like what Muscatine has to offer as far as trails and how to improve healthy living in your own backyard is the mantra. And we'd really like, really thank you for, for your commitment to that. Um, <clears throat> upcoming activities, we are set to launch three walking school buses at the end of October. So um, we've met with Superintendent Reby and the three school principals, and we're just really excited to see those going. Um, a study has shown recently that there's very few students that actually walk to school compared to like the 1970s, for instance. And re-engineering steps in, back into their day um, and just getting them ready for school, you know, walking, getting their blood flowing, um, we'd really like to see that help attendance in schools as well. So we're really excited to get those going. Um, one walking school bus in particular is over on Colorado Street, um, which the sidewalk that was recently put in, um, that will really help those kids walk to school. And then the sidewalk in Weed Park that was recently put in will also help the kids in the Weed Park area. So really thrilled about that. And the other things that we have going on is uh, we continue to have our plant-based cooking classes. We have those once a month out at hy V. Ivy has been a great partner, and we continue to see great attendance at these classes. Um, and it's just really teaching people, like, you know, you don't have to eat, 
you know, fruits and vegetables, you know, only, but just adding those into your diet and showing people how, how to cook with these um, in a fun, unique way. And it's also a great time for people to get together socially. Um, we are set to have a walking Moai launch on October 28th. And this is also to commemorate the, the new sidewalk in Weed Park. We're actually going to do a ribbon cutting on that sidewalk. Um, and folks from Wellmark that helped facilitate the, or gave us the grant to do these sidewalks, um, we're going to celebrate with them and then do uh, after, after the, we're going to do after walk celebration at Yakishak. Um, and then we would just like to thank the Blue Zones uh, people that have been involved, the, the city staff, um, the school district. We'd like to thank uh, all the residents that have really helped with the Blue Zones project because this is a community-wide initiative that without their help, without your help, we wouldn't be where we are. So we really continue your ongoing commitment. Um, and some other things kind of coming up are in the preliminary stages, we're looking at doing a worksite summit. Um, and this will be a place where all of the work sites that are designated could come together and share best practices. Because what we find in the Blue Zones Project is there's all these great stories to tell, there's all these great successes, and having a platform to share those, we, we feel will really just help everyone collaborate. So again, um, I'd really like to thank you, uh, again, the city um, and council for your ongoing support, and um, I'm open to any questions if anyone has any. Only thing I can think of is, do you have any sense for how we stack up with some of the other communities? How many? You know, <clears throat> I can give you a statistic. Um, so Muscatine has seen some progress <coughs> in their well-being. We're measured by the Gallup Healthways Well-Being Index. And we, our report is that um, we are at 80% of those surveyed um, as far as people aware of the Blue Zones Project. So we're second to Mason City. Um, we have also... Um, We've raised six percentage points in people that exercise regularly, and we've also raised uh, seven percentage points to people um, eating healthy. So, um, and those statistics are great. Muscatine, um, and Greg could address this as well, but Muscatine is looked at often um, as being a poster child for the Blue Zones Project. Um, and I really attribute that to the city's collabor the collaboration with the city. Um, and the, f the things that we're able to make happen to make this place a better place to live and to increase walkability and livability. I mean, Mississippi Drive Corridor Project is a great example of that, that we really look forward to future collaboration um, and just making the city a place where people want to be and people are able to just, you know, enjoy their life. Um, but Muscatine is definitely looked at as one of those places, so we're really proud of that. Yes. I have a question. Jody, well, it's not really a, yeah, it is a question. <laughs> Back up a little bit. You, you mentioned briefly uh, the roundabout. What would you say there's an element of folks in Muscatine that are not in favor of that roundabout and talk negatively about it? What would you say to those people? Well, um, I would talk about the facts. So the facts are that it has, I mean, it's statistically roundabouts. Um, if there is an accident that occurs, it would be less severe. Um, traffic my own personal experience is that when I'm on Cedar Street, c traffic is constantly flowing, and so you don't have that backup. There's so many kids that live in that area that are the YMCA and, and the apartments and um, people that live on Cedar Street, and just having that area wider and people able to walk and having traffic flow like slower, it slows stuff down and it also keeps it going. So that's just my personal opinion. I mean, we are... Um, you know, really happy with the results of the roundabout. And I know Greg and I communicate often just to keep up on, you know, how's it going? Have there been any accidents? And um, a lot of times we'll be asked if how those things are going by healthways. Um, right now they're looking at doing a uh, case study on Muscatine to see all the things we've implemented and how that's changing our lives here in Muscatine. So I've, I've heard positive things, but again, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. That's. Would you personally encourage uh, the construction of more? I don't know. I would have to look at where, where those were going to be and hear, hear why. I mean, I, I can't imagine that it um, would be something that would be negative. But again, you know, I would like to know all the facts and um, why someone has chosen to put it there and what the, what the anticipated outcome would be. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else, Council? 
you may wish to, may be interested in knowing that there are thousands all over Europe, tens of thousands. First one was put in in England in 1909. Oh, wow. It worked pretty well. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, you know, it, it's, it's something new, and I understand. It, it, no, it takes, right, that, but I mean, here in Muscatine, you know, it's, it's, it's things people need to get used to or um, have gotten used to, and um, <coughs> I know that I would like to see more uh, projects that increase safety, for sure, especially kids walking to school. Um, I know that's something that we're definitely trying to figure out is how to get kids to walk to school safely and um, just looking at Cedar Street right now, like I said, I mean, I'm sure all of you have seen it. I mean, it's, it's awesome. So. Yes. Thank you again. Thank you, Jody. Good good Appreciate all your hard work. <coughs> okay, item number four on tonight's agenda, Strong Communities presentation. Adam, is that you? Dave, it's Dave. Okay. Hello, Dave. Hello, Adam. Dave and Adam. This is a twofer tonight. Um, thank you very much for your report, Jody. Um, and but uh, as you all know, change is a word that some people take differently than others. <laughs> um, we are here to present to you because it was asked of the council to to come before it and give you kind of a progress report on a couple of business programs that we have been, we put together and launched in December last year. We worked with the banks, the three banks, three local banks, and uh, pooled a million dollars, which you'll see in the report. And then uh, we're gonna give you some of the results and some of the success stories from that. The second program we'll be talking about tonight is the uh, Small Business Forgivable Loan Program. And that's a, it's a mouthful, but um, the point is that it's also had a tremendous amount of success and leverage in the marketplace. And uh, we, we're looking forward to doing more. And I'm going to let Adam present this. Uh, he, he does most of the administrative aspects of this program, so are these two programs. So I'll step aside and be here for, for questions. <laughs> Obviously, I need to change up. Uh PowerPoints, Nancy likes to be well prepared, but I am not giving budget uh, financial statements. Let me get this changed up here. You both look very nice tonight, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> Mayor, Council, uh, thank you for uh, letting Dave and I um, present on uh, what we're calling a small business creation project. Uh, and uh, let us start off by thanking um, uh, our partners in this project, uh, CBI, uh, Bank and Trust. And I'll apologize right now if I happen to call them Central State Bank in the future. I'm still working through that uh, transition, uh, as well as Community Bank and Trust and uh, First National Bank. And, and obviously, uh, City Council, the City of Muscatine, is is very much a strong partner in this project and these uh, program going forward. Um, so the goals of small business creation in Muscatine, um, obviously we want to support uh, local small businesses, and, and I really want to connect this back to the tagline um, that we use as a part of the the award application that we wrote and kind of tagline of the small business creation project. And that is to support and grow the foundation of a thriving community. Um, and, and much of me and Dave's travels talking to entrepreneurial programs across the state, they, they, there's a shift between trying to attract businesses from outside or towards trying to grow with, from within. Um, and obviously here in Muscatine, we've been quite successful with that, with a number of... Uh, local businesses that start out as small businesses and, and grow into uh, uh, national and international companies. So it's really kind of getting back to what the foundation of uh, Muscatine is. Um, also to uh, encourage uh, local entrepreneurs, um, there's, there's a, a culture being developed uh, in, in Muscatine to support and encourage entrepreneurs here locally, um, really looking at trying to drive that more as well as to drive uh, infill development in targeted uh, areas around the city to really uh, reinvigorate and uh, rejuvenate those areas in the downtown and, and uh, key districts. 
<clears throat> it works. It might be easier. Um, so the first program um, that we're going to talk about is a small business forgivable loan program. This was a um, program that started back in December. I think we awarded our first loan in January. Small business forgivable loan um, gives new businesses the opportunity to receive a loan up to $25,000, $15,000 for startup costs. These are costs um, incurred in startup that we're calling that are more permanent. So remodeling or anything along those lines that are critical to the business um, that are more permanent. So you know, if they're buying a couch, that's not really what that's intended for. We want the improvements to stay with the location. Um, and then $10,000 for code-related expenses. So this can be anything from handicap access to um, sprinkler systems, um, any health requirements that they, they have to meet um, as per, uh, per local ordinance or law, state or federal regulations. Um, city Council, um, you guys have uh, put forth $100,000 per fiscal year um, to be lent out as a part of this project. We have three targeted districts that the business have to be located in, um, one being the downtown, Park Avenue, and then uh, the Grandview um, is the other, other district as well. So the, the location has to be, the property has to be within one of those three districts. Um, and we're really looking for businesses that are either new businesses or currently operating businesses that are expanding into a new product line or a new service. So really the key is, you know, there has to be something new with what the business is getting into. Uh, and, and to fill uh, vacant business locations with strong, viable businesses, um, you know, the, along Grandview, the downtown Park Avenue, there's a number of, of business locations that, that are um, great spots for, for a new startup and really trying to drive that forward. And, and fill those vacant uh, businesses. Um, so to date, we have lent seven small business forgivable loan. Um, I guess that's probably something I should have had back on the other slide, but the, the term of these loans are five years with 20% of the loan being forgiven annually at the uh, origination date of the loan, um, given that they've completed the required annual reporting for uh, for the project and currently, I mean, we're only 10 months into these, this project, so none of the current businesses have completed um, their, their annual report yet. Um, so the seven businesses that we have lent to is Big River Guns, Home Run Hitters, Well Fit Nutrition Bar, Playmore Fun Center, um, also Rose Bowl, uh, Hannah's Awesome Treats, Sign Pro 3D Printing, and Sal Vitale's Italian Restaurant. Um, and the following slides um, are just a, f a little bit more detail on, on each one of those businesses. I'm not going to go into the detail right now, but if you have any questions about them, feel free to contact myself, Dave, Greg, ask questions at the end of the presentation uh, well, as well if you'd like. So we're going to skip ahead here a little bit. All right, the, the other program that Dave mentioned is the Building Improvements Loan Program. And this one... We, we really could not do without our partners, without CBI, Community Bank and Trust, and, and First National Bank. You know, they're, they're the ones that are, you know, really uh, responsible for this program. Yes, the city, you know, administers it and helps, you know, helps with the administration of it, but it wouldn't be possible without them. Um, the three local banks have committed to $1 million in building improvement loans. Um, the little carrot that goes along with it is acceptable projects um, receive a 1% below prime interest rate. Um, so it's not, not free money, but it's um, a little incentive to help encourage business owners and property owners to, to fix up their buildings. Um, uh, the funding goes towards infrastructure, more critical infrastructure. So the types of funding that we've done currently is roof, sewer lines, facades, had a number that are interested in doing um, sprinkler systems with them. They haven't moved forward with that yet, but that's another option that we have with this, as well as um, remodeling for, uh, for the business operations. Um, we did start with this program being used in a very small district in the downtown. 
with the bank support, we have expanded that to the three districts that we use for the small business forgivable loan as well. So it's used in the downtown, uh, the Grandview Ave district, as well as the Park Ave district. Um, process starts out by the, the city staff, uh, myself, Dave, receiving an application from the, from the project. It is reviewed by myself, by our uh, building inspector, and then if there's some things that need to be changed, we communicate with the property owner and make sure that it's a quality project. And then if it passes our review, then we um, write a letter of support for the project and forward it on to the financial institution that they're working with. And then uh, the, the bank is responsible for um, taking it from there. So making sure that uh, the, the business or the individual meets the financial lending requirements and, um, and takes everything down, down the, that route. Um, currently with this program, we have lent, or the banks have lent, um, $220,000 uh, through this program. So it's, it's, been, it's been used with uh, large projects, which, which is great. Um, additionally, so the other piece that we have along with oh. this is, is additional uh, bank financing from uh, C, uh, CBI, Bank and Trust, Community Bank and Trust, and First National Bank. And these are the funds in addition to, to make these proje projects success successful. It's used, uh, it complements the Small Business Forgivable Loan uh, Program, and it's also used in conjunction with other incentive programs, you know, such as the Building Improvements Loan Program. Uh, a new business may use that for the Building Improvements Loan Program for some improvements to their building. And then they also need to purchase infrastructure or some sort of uh, capital equipment for their business operations. And, and uh, the three local banks have been, been great in uh, providing additional funding for uh, small businesses here in Muscatine. So uh, let's look at the numbers a little bit. Um, this is the leverage piece of what the small business creation project has done here in Muscatine. Through the Small Business Forgivable Loan, we have lent $125,000 to the seven local small businesses, $220,000 through the Building Improvements Loan Program, to, and that's been to uh, three projects with those funds. And then, uh, so private financing to support business development. This can either be financing from the banks or personal financing for these projects is or sorry, $730,000. So in total, we have over a million dollars invested in small business creation over the last 10 months into these 10 projects here in Muscatine. Um, additionally, so that's, you know, jobs are also important uh, with small business as well. Uh, through this program, we have created seven full-time positions, 18 part-time positions, and a number of construction jobs as well. Um, and the, the with, with small new businesses, jobs start off very small in the beginning. A lot of these businesses are one, two person operations, you know, multiple part time. As those businesses grow, expand, start receiving more customers, we look to them adding more jobs, uh, more positions in the future. So that's, you know, one of the goals of this as well as as those grow, creates more jobs here locally. Um, so let's talk about some, some recognition that uh, we're looking at receiving for, for this project. Uh, we've been nominated by uh, Community Bank and Trust to receive a Strong Communities Award. This Strong Communities Award is presented from the, by the Federal Home Loan Bank, uh, the Des Moines member region. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's an award given to to strong communities that do a project in their community that represents what a, a strong community is, what a strong community is about. First place receives $15,000, second place receives $3,000, and if successful with this award and this, this grant, we'll take those funds and, and put it back into a uh, small business effort. Um, I, I don't think we've worked out the details of what necessarily will be, but it will work to to help uh, support and grow small business in Muscatine. Um, additionally, you know, we were nominated <coughs> by Community Bank and Trust, but it's also supported by C, uh, CBI, 
FDI Bank and Trust and First National Bank of Muscatine. All three local financial institutions are uh, the F FHLB Des Moines members, so uh, which is unique for this. Um, past past uh, award winners have been one one member bank. So this really goes towards what I think the strong community is about. We think the strong community award is about is community coming together to to better uh, better better. Uh, so we need everyone's help in uh, getting us to to this award. Just like I think you guys saw a lot last week on our drinking fountains, there is a voting process for that. There's a voting opportunity for this project as well. Um, you can vote once every 24 hours um, on any device that you may have. So cell phone, computer, work computer, home computer, kids' computer, grandparents' computer, kids. I can keep going on, but any device that you can find. Um, the website to vote is fhlb4community.com slash voting. You can also get um, to vote through the city of Muscatine website. So you go to muscatineiowa.gov. And if you just scroll down on the home page in the spotlight section, there's an area that you can click there to vote as well. Um, it's not 100% determined by votes, but votes <coughs> is another criteria that they use in determining um, who, they, who they award or the projects to. Um, with this award, we're one of four finalists in the rural category. So, you know, really looking for the community support in, uh, in supporting this award nomination. And, and again, you know, this would not be possible without, without our partners, without city council. Um, in this project, so a big thanks goes out to you guys, uh, CBI Bank and Trust, Community Bank and Trust, and First National Bank. So with that, that concludes my presentation. Uh, Greg and Dave, if you have anything to add. Did a great job. Yeah. <coughs> Council, yeah, any questions? Happy to answer questions. Just a yeah. comment, if, if I go back a couple of years, there were some small business uh, owners in town that, that made it, uh, brought it to my attention that, you know, that they, they think something needed to be done. They weren't sure what or how the city might even help, but it, it's clear that we're we're doing something. This this is definitely a great start. You know, I, I know at least internally there are some other things that we're looking at doing to cr keep the support of uh, small business creation and Muscatine going. Um, so it's it's something that is is always on our mind and how we can better help uh, local businesses here in Muscatine. If the if the businesses have uh, downtown businesses have rental space above, can they apply for the forgivable loan and or this in home or building improvement loan to with the rental spaces if they want to do some work on those that would qualify also. Yes, yep, it, quali it qualifies I as mean, well. I mean, it's all business. If, yep. it's for, if it's business related, if it's not, not, uh, not living space. Right. If it's not living, their living space. Right, living space, no, it's not, not for rental, rental space, upper story housing. This is not for that. This is, this is for commercial and retail uh, or small business development. Okay. Right. Dave's, Dave's working on part two on, on the upper story uh, redevelopment program, and we'll this be back to talk more about that certainly as well. It doesn't well. include the uh, the grant for the for the backside for the alley in the backside of the. That's an addition to. That's, that's an, an addition. addition that's a five hundred thousand dollar grant for the rehab on the backsides of the uh, between Iowa and <coughs> C. Um, so that's even an addition. That's to an this. addition uh, yep. to this, and, and that's certainly uh, supporting those uh, yep. local downtown property uh, and as well. And, and those property owners are able to take advantage of the building improvements loan program as well. We have at least one property owner that's looking at going above and beyond the work as a part of the CDBG project and capitalizing on the building improvements loan program to improve his building uh, even more. Anyone else, Council? Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Much. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Folks, item number five on tonight's agenda, the year-end budget basis <coughs> financial statement presentation. That would be Nancy.
Tonight we're going to review the budget basis financial statements for the city for the year end in June 30th, uh, 2015. The actual audit report, the on-site work, audit work is completed. Um, the actual audit report will be released um, probably the first part of December. Um, but the, the on-site work is completed for that. Um, this kind of um, uh, wraps up last fiscal year and gets us uh, ready for going into the budget for the next fiscal year, 16-17. What the city spends a lot of time on during budget is the general fund, and that's what the emphasis will be on our um, presentation tonight, but we'll also uh, do an over, overlook of the other funds as well. Uh, first slide is general fund fund statement. Uh, that shows the major re revenue categories in the general fund. Um, the general fund funds the basic city services, um, police, fire, um, public works, uh, library, Arts Center, Parks and Recreation, and General City Administration. The major funding source for that is uh, property taxes, and last year there was about $7,130,000 in property taxes. There was also utility taxes, hotel motel taxes of $353,000, uh, cable franchise, cable uh, utility franchise, <coughs> about $350,000 in licenses and permits. Uh, fines and forfeitures, uh, just over a million dollars in fines last year. Uh, intergovernmental revenue, 731000 and that's revenue from other governments, federal government, state government, other local governments. Charges for services, 560000 Use of money and property, uh, that's uh, rents, interest, uh, leases, that type of thing, 108000 and the various other miscellaneous revenues that total 671,000. So there's um, about 11.233 million of general fund revenues uh, last year. Um, expenditures on the next page. Uh, this is broken out by the function of the general fund expenditure. And then it's further broken out into whether it's current operating or capital outlay. Again, as in every year, public safety is the uh, significant um, um, majority of the general fund's costs. Um, public safety, about $8.2 million in operating um, expenditures, and an additional $94,000 uh, below in capital outlay. Public works, $2,146,000 in pub, um, operating and additional uh, an additional 179,000 in capital. Um, health and social services, 20,000. That's a subsidy to senior resources. Uh, culture and recreation, and that um, area includes um, all the park and recreation activities as well as the library and art center. Uh, that was 2,766,000 in operating and an additional about 220 in uh, capital. Uh, community and economic development, 835,000 operating and a small amount, 2,200 in capital. And then general government, 2.1 million in uh, operating, an additional 32,000 in capital. General government includes uh, the mayor and council budget, city administrator, HR, finance, um, general city building and grounds, um, risk management, IT, and that also um, includes the city's insurance costs. So the total expenditures was about 16.6 million. And before we take into consideration uh, trans funding transfers in, our revenues are actually less than expenditures by uh, 5.355 million. The next page, um, that shows our funding transfers in. That includes uh, road use taxes, uh, employee benefits tax levy, uh, transfer from ambulance for a portion of the fire department costs, perpetual care interest, and TIF funds. So those totaled about 6.6 .6 million. Um, by state law, some of those um, areas have to be accounted for as a special revenue fund, and then with the money transferred to the general fund. Uh, transfers out, and these are kind of the opposite of that. Some tax levies have to be received in the general fund, and then we can transfer them out. That includes the transit tax levy, 
and the mad um, and the levy tax levy, which we transfer <coughs> to the Transit Enterprise Fund and the um, Mad Creek Levy Capital Project Fund. Uh, so the total other financing sources and uses, 5.9 million. Uh, the next area is uh, pretty significant. This is where we take revenues and other sources and compare it to expenditures and other uses. And revenues and other sources did exceed expenditures by 538,000 during the past year, and that results in an increase in the general fund balance. Uh, we had estimated um, 3,472,000. That was our actually be actual beginning balance, and our ending balance uh, is about uh, just slightly over 4 million. We did have outstanding purchase orders at the end of the year of 104,000 to come down to an unreserved ending balance of 3.9 million, uh, which is a very strong um, uh, fiscal year general fund ending balance. Uh, the <clears throat> next slide is kind of an analysis on how we get to that, um, where we are in the general fund and why we ended the year the way we did. Uh, when we did the original budget, and this is, I can't see across the room, uh, we thought the ending balance would be, a, be close to $3 million. Um, when we did the revised estimate last year, when we did the 15-16 budget, we had, amended that up, up to about 3.5 million and then we compare that to the actual of 3.9 million so we're actually over the revised estimate estimate by 380,000 which is very good um, and then we also look at the percent the ending fund balance is of the general fund expenditures and this is the measure we had uh, amended our financial policies, our general fund financial policy to in November of 2013. Um, prior to that, it was officially a minimum of 10% of general fund balance. We um, revised it so it was a minimum of 16.7%. And so our actual ending balance came out at 22.6%, which was higher than estimated. I do a few other calculations down there. Some of the encumbrances will actually be funded for low use tax, so it, it actually is a little higher than what we're um, using um, based on the bottom of the slide, 22.8%. <clears throat> the next slide, um, we did have one item that was budgeted um, that was not completed, um, and that was painting of the soccer uh, complex roofs, that 24,000 has been carried forward. So that would, in effect, reduce that percentage down to a little bit to about 22.5%, but still well over our estimate. Uh, the next part of this slide, um, go through the general categories of revenues and compare it to the, to the revised estimate, and then we also do the same for expenditures. And I'll just kind of skip through this. Um, <coughs> The revenues and other and transfers in were actually under our estimate by 133,000, um, but the transfers in were under. So without those being, and the transfers in were under because expenditures were under. So without those, we would have we would have reached all our uh, revenue estimates. I'll kind of just skip down through there. Tax collections a little over our estimate, 8,200. Uh, some of the other utility taxes, utility franchise, and the state commercial and industrial, um, some of those were under. The state reimbursement was slightly over um, by 13.7. Cable franchise fees was under. Um, and this is where we're getting into the uh, road use tax transfer in. It's under the revised estimate what, by 171,000 because the corresponding expenditures were under. Uh, similar uh, with the employee benefits, the um, uh, actual costs were less than estimated by, by 7,200, uh, so um, that's also a, a good thing that that's under budget. Then health insurance uh, transfer, hotel motel tax this year. A year ago, um, hotel motel taxes were significant, significantly higher than what we had estimated. This year, it's um, um, gone down um, pretty close to previous levels. 
but we did increase our estimate based on a year ago's higher amount, but it is under by 61,000. And then the rest of um, the revenue area is kind of by department, and so I'll skip through those. Um, building department revenue is slightly under by 7,100. Uh, the next slide has uh, library revenues were over, art center revenues were over, uh, parks and rec was slightly under, uh, mainly aquatic center revenues, which is a lot uh, weather driven. Uh, cemetery revenues were under. Um, this is uh, sales of grave spaces and burial fees. Public works revenues was under. Police grants were slightly over. Uh, the um, court fines actually came in under our estimate by 27,000. Uh, we have projected these to increase with our change from the separate city prosecutor to the use of the county attorney and we haven't realized the full amount of the impact from that at this point so it was it that did come in under uh, the next area was very strong though and this is our the collections from the automatic traffic enforcement fines that was over our estimate by slightly over two hundred thousand that's mostly due to use of the state's income offset program um, to collect prior year um, prior year and currently year unpaid fines and this was the first year that we um, that we did that and it was um, it was very successful in, in making those collections and that is handled um, um, by um, municipal collections of America our collection agent for that so a lot of the paperwork involved in that um, he handles for the city um, other police revenues over by 12,000 and then licenses and permits fire and various other revenues were slightly over the estimate. So even though the bottom line says we're under by 133,000, it's only because the funding transfers in were under. The next page um, goes through the expenditures um, by function of the city. And all of uh, the departments uh, operated within their, their budgets. Um, in total, uh, expenditures were under by 513,000. Um, of that, 24,000 was the carry forward for the soccer complex roof painting. And the general government activities, all the administrative um, activities, activities of the city was under by 81,000. Public safety actually came in under by 212,000. Some of that is vacancies that occurred during the year uh, fuel costs were um, lower than we had estimated and maintenance costs. Library, art center, and parks was under by 80,000. Uh, community and econo economic development was under by 9,500. Public works was under by 101,000. Um, airport subsidy was under by 6,300. And the only area that was over was um, the transfers out. And that was because the um, tax levies came in higher than what we'd estimated. So that's directly related to increased revenue. So overall, um, departments did a good job of staying within their, their budget last fiscal year. Uh, the next slide, we've got a graphical um, representation of the last 10 years of general fund balance. And our low year was in FY 2008-2009, which was a memorable budget year um, and since that time we've increased uh, some of the decreases during this um, time period were budgeted decreases so even though we're showing it decreasing at FY 12 13 that was the year we funded um, I think the um, fire fire engines financial software and we were able to do that without borrowing money we were able to take it from the fund balance above the minimum fund balance level and then our 3.9 million is um, our, our record high at this point. The next slide shows those same 10 years and this shows the percent of the general fund ending balance as a percent of um, general fund expenditures. So again, that 2008-2009 uh, year was our, our most challenging year. That was down to 10.8%. And since that time, we've, we've been increasing it and well above even our newly um, set um, 
minimum fund balance level in, in the, in the um, financial policies. Um, the next slide, and I'm going to pick and choose uh, which things to, um, to highlight, but everything that has a footnote number, um, there's an explanation for the difference on, on future pages. Um, this shows them all the funds, operating funds, down the left-hand um, side. It shows what the original budgeted ending balance was projected to be, and that was set in March of 2014. The revised estimate fund balance, which was set in March of 15, and that's what we've been using for the comparison. And then we're showing the actual ending fund balance and whether then that difference is the far right column and whether it's favorable or unfavorable. Uh, the first line item is general fund, which we've um, just reviewed. That's over our estimate by about 380,000. Um, some of the smaller ones I'm going to skip. Um, uh, water pollution control, that is, our revenues were slightly under budget by 37000 and that was pri primarily in the industrial area, but expenditures were under by $124,000. Uh, there is a carry forward, though, in that fund of 91000 for the dredge line extension uh, project. So when you take that into consideration, their ending balance is very close to what we projected it to be. Uh, collection and drainage, um, that is 81000 higher. Um, most of that is because expenditures were under by about 79000 and revenues were slightly over by $3,000. Uh, refuse collection, it shows that we're under our original revised estimate by about $30,000. Uh, we did amend their budget in May for some things that had come up since we had done the budget. Uh, one of the things was that um, we had, before that we had a, a firm that was doing the compost site chipping for, for no fee, and they were just doing it so they could have the mulch. That firm went out of business, and we can't locate anybody else that will do it under that arrangement. So we had 12000 to chip um, uh, brush in the compost site, and there was also uh, 20000 for increased vehicle maintenance costs. I'm sorry, 20000 for? increased vehicle maintenance costs. That deficit fund balance and refuse collection of 28000 we knew the, but the fund balance was going to be close because we had estimated it to be $637, which is very minimal. Um, that does take into account, though, the encumbrance for the automated refuse collection vehicle. So that's already deducted from the fund balance, and we haven't bought it yet we haven't paid for it uh, but we include outstanding purchase orders when we um, do the analysis okay, I'm, I'm not sure i heard all that but we're about sixty five thousand dollars <coughs> delta in refuse collection is that right we're under where we we thought we'd have a minimal ending balance of six hundred thirty seven dollars mm -hmm. we actually have a deficit of twenty eight four which is a difference of about 29,000. Yeah, I was looking at the original budget. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll switch to a very positive fund, the, the landfill fund. And we had thought we'd still have a deficit at June 30th of 183,000. It's actually a positive balance for the first time in a very long time of 100,000. Uh, we had thought we'd, uh, the deficit would be eliminated next fiscal year um, but we had allowed for funds for the um, groundwater remediation work, and that had not all been done by June 30th. So if we had done that, we would still have a small deficit, but we, we have officially eliminated the deficit in the landfill fund as of um, fiscal year 14-15. Um, uh, landfill revenues actually were over 130, about 139,000. Uh, because of increased um, usage. Expenditures were under by 145000 uh, which includes that groundwater remediation work. So it, we do have a strong waste volume. It was close to 39,000 tons when we were budgeting uh, based on 35,000, which has been right about where it's been the last several years. Um, 
Transfer station is another fund with a deficit um, of 21,000. Uh, this was budgeted, we knew it was um, a close budget. We had budgeted for it to be 24,000 deficit and it's actually a little less of a deficit. Um, some of um, the reason for the deficit, um, their revenues were higher by 219,000 um, and expenditures were over the original revised estimate by 216,000. A lot of um, the transfer station budget is driven by the waste volume going through it. So when waste volume is up, expenditures are also up. But the ending balance was close to where we thought it would be. Um, some of the reason the, um, that that fund is tight is that the revenue from the negotiated contracts for the landfill, all that's been directed to the landfill fund. So in the past, we had positive balances in <coughs> refuse and transfer station and negatives in landfill, and it's kind of swapped out this year. Um, that will be considered in, as part of next year's budget. Um, some of these others, um, parking came out. I'm of sorry, Nancy. Can I back you up? Sure. What is the transfer station closure reserve? Um, the state requires both for the landfill and the transfer station. Well, I'm sure I understand the landfill, but they require it for the transfer station too. So if if it was closed for some reason, we'd have to bury it. We would have to, it's only $39,000, um, but we're required to set that money aside. It's probably not intended for transfer stations like ours. It's probably intended for smaller operations around the state. Thank you. Okay. Um, parking, uh, revenues were over by about 11,000. Expenditures were under by 7,100. Uh, golf course, uh, relatively small ending balance, but it's about 30,000 higher than where we thought it would be. Good. Boat Harbor is uh, less by 4,700. Uh, ambulance had a very strong year. Um, it's over the estimate by 84,000. And that is uh, mainly revenues. Uh, revenues came in over our estimate by 57,000 and expenditures were under the estimate by 27,000. So a very good year for the ambulance fund. Whoops. Some of the internal service funds, the health insurance fund is 25,000 <clears> less than where we thought it would be, but it still has 1,445,000 in there. Uh, the next page, uh, these are special revenue funds. The employee benefits fund is higher by 90,000 than, than what we thought it would be. Uh, some of that is we allowed for, uh, the city's required to fund medical expenses for employees that retired due to an on-the-job on injury. We had allowed 50,000 for um, a knee medical work and that hasn't happened yet. Um, we haven't heard from him to see if it's just delayed or if it's um, um, still needed. Uh, local option is higher by 59,000 and that's the timing of the capital projects. Road use tax uh, was very good for the year so our ending balance is over by 433,000. Um, that the revenue coming in was higher than we had estimated by 262,000. Uh, part of that is the increase in the gas tax and then just the normal economy drives that as far as fuel <coughs> purchases. Uh, funding transfers were less than what we'd estimated by 171,000. A lot of that was <coughs> in the general fund and some of that was carried forward to next fiscal year. Um, then I'll we'll skip down to housing and both of those uh, public housing came in um, a little greater than what, we, what we'd estimated by about 33,000 and the voucher program was higher by 17,000 and that's those are directly related to HUD funding. So overall most funds are close to where we thought they'd be and, um, and we have uh, just two funds that are deficit, the uh, refuse and the transfer station. 
the next three slides are kind of a summary of footnotes. <clears throat> I won't go through them because that, that's what I was kind of using as part of the presentation. Um, so I think we're down to the final summary at the end. And this is, um, again, the ending fund balance is 22.6% of expenditures. We had originally budgeted at 16.8%. Revised decimal was 19.8. So that 22.6 um, is um, significantly higher than what we had um, budgeted. Uh, that balance meets the um, uh, requirements of the city's general fund, fund balance policy which is 16.7%. Um, that ending balance also helps position the city to address future budget challenges. And one of those challenges, um, that, um, um, known challenges, is the rollback of the multi-residential property va values. That starts in FY17, so the first year of, of it will be in the budget that we'll be working on in the next couple months. And it, uh, those values will be rolled back to the residential rates by FY24. So it's going to be a long, we don't have a good handle on how much impact that will be at this point, but once we get the numbers from the assessor for um, this upcoming year's budget, we'll be able to project the future year's uh, um, decline in taxable values. As I said before, there was positive balances in all funds with exception of refuse and transfer station. Um, and I had to highlight it again, the landfill deficit is no longer a deficit, which is, which is excellent. And then most um, funds have um, good strong balances going into next year's budget um, process. Any questions I can try to <coughs> Yes, sir. I have an unusual. First of all, thank you. You gave us answers we hoped for. That's always appreciated. Um, if one suspects irregularities in state and local sales tax, what are the uh, provisions for audits? How does one go about that? You may, you may not know the answer. Um, so you're talking local option tax or? Um well, both state sales tax and, and, uh, and uh, yeah, local sales paid, tax. Paid by a, by a local in, entity? Correct. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how we, would, we could ask the question of the state people. Would you please? Um, yeah. Yeah. And I'm not sure. I, I think they have, um, they're audited as well. Um, and it probably, um, if, if, if they're collecting it, and they're giving us our 1%, I would think that their audit would address any issue about that if, if they were collecting things that we weren't getting. Anything that people aren't paying is a whole nother issue. And that's, that's the question. It's not being paid, or uh, perhaps. And that, the uh, tax that, I have in mind, I don't know if that comes to us from the, through the state or whether it comes to us directly. I don't know the answer to that. But. Well, we, local option will come through the state. But, um, it all goes through the state. The local option is all paid to the state. Yeah. Hotel, motel tax is paid to the state, and then they uh, remit it back to entities. Got it. Thank we, you. We can ask okay. the Iowa Finance Authority. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Nancy, the, like the CVB coming into the city, that was after after this fiscal year, right? That was done as of June 30th. So in the audited statements, um, we're showing it as being an operation in FY15, but with an equity transfer out at June 30th, and the equity transfer in as an enterprise fund in FY, at the end of FY15. And that will, um, that will make it easier to manage going forward. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions, Council? Mm -hmm. Another good job. Thank Very you. good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. If anybody wants any, you know, department detail, it's all in the handout that we gave you last week. You don't. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen, item six on tonight's agenda, we're pulling that uh, to be discussed at a later date, the proposed community development fees presentation. So uh, we're not talking about that tonight. 
Uh, item seven is uh, comments from council members. Uh, Mike. Uh, a couple of meetings ago, I don't recall exactly when, but we were given that information about where the county stacks up on different social and health and crime statistics. And I asked that we, uh, that a report be generated showing the historical crime statistics for Muscatine. Are they going up? Are we going down? You know, where are we? And uh, I wrote an email to you, Greg, but never yes. got a response on that. Yes, and it's been in the uh, last couple updates. It'll be in the update going out tonight as well. Police Department's preparing a presentation for City Council, and um, we just got the CLIA report today, I believe, it, yesterday. And so we're going to touch on the accreditation report at the same time uh, for City Council. So they're working on that presentation right now. When do you expect that to be scheduled? November in depth. Good. Great. Thank you. Phil. Nothing at this time, Your Honor. Cut. I think we have the public safety open house Sunday, right, Chief? Sunday, 12 to 3. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Well, Nothing this evening, Your Honor. Great. Just a reminder to vote. Vote. Early and vote. often. Early and often, that's right. Absolutely. Oh, and um, we had a meeting with Bolton and Mink to, today, and tentative, uh, the next public meeting on Mississippi Drive Corridor is November 10th. We'll, of course, get that information out there, but just as an FYI. Uh, Any ideas? Uh, 530, location? Riverfront, most likely. Uh, Riverview, excuse me, most likely. Um, but we'll, of course, get more information. Just, so just to kind of a hold the date, uh, Tuesday, November 10th. Very good. Fran. Nothing, Your Honor. Thank you. And I have nothing. Is there any other business, Council? For motion to adjourn. So moved. Meeting is adjourned. Well, I thought he was going to.